wonderful. So good afternoon, uh, good morning. Welcome to this HUMA book launch seminar series. Um, this is a space for discussing critical work written about Africa. And the seminar is hosted by HUMA, the Institute for Humanities in Africa, located at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. There are several uh, questions which we attempt to engage with uh, at HUMA, notably what it means to be human in Africa today. My name is Amina Slimani, and I'm a doctoral research fellow. And today I'm really delighted to be hosting Dr. Marisa Mika uh, joining us from California. And it's 7 a.m. Uh, on her end. So thank you so much, Dr. Mika, for your generosity and, and for being here. So the book we're launching today is Africanizing Oncology, Creativity, Crisis, and Cancer in Uganda, published by Ohio University Press in 2021. I also happen to have a copy um, that I'm very happy about. Um, Prof. Marisa Mika is a visiting scholar at the Center for Science, Technology, Medicine, and Society at the University of California, Berkeley. Africanizing oncology describes the political, social, technological, and biomedical dimensions of how Ugandans created, sustained, and transformed the Cancer Research Institute over the past half century. Most importantly, and as stated um, in, in the introduction, which you uh, might have had access to, uh, courtesy of, of Dr. Mika, uh, the book is concerned with how oncology became part of the biomedical practice in Uganda and how do Ugandans Africanize oncology. Marisa, thank you so much for joining us once more today and I will hand it over to you um, to present about the book and we'll open it right after for Q&A and a discussion with um, all the participants uh, that are here with us. Thank you so much. It's an absolute delight to be here. And um, it's also, I'm also really glad that at least some of us had a chance to meet in person a couple of weeks ago. Um, and so sending you all warm greetings from California. And I still wish that I were in Cape Town. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen um, just so that we have some visual context. Um, let me just get us fired up here. Um, and what I thought I would do is, um, you know, I'll, I'll give like kind of an overall summary of the book and, um, and you know, just kind of highlight a couple of the key arguments of it. Um, and then I also just kind of, and then I'm going to share a couple of remarks just about kind of the longer, kind of the ways in which this book is situated in a broader conversation about biomedicine and the study of biomedicine in Africa um, that I would say has been kind of a, I would say that it's it's been a conversation that's been relatively specific to colleagues working in the United States and some in Europe. Um, but I thought that that might be an interesting starting point to think about um, to just kind of think about where these conversations are happening, um, kind of the blind spots in these conversations, uh, where we might be seeing conversations about decolonization, particularly around global health, kind of going forward. Um, so that's where I'm going to take us. And I just want to affirm that you can all hear me decently. Yes, perfectly. Okay, perfect. Um, and I just want to say that because I am in my house, there is a chance that you will see a human walking down to make himself a cup of tea at some point. Um, so I hope that's not too distracting. Um, so books, when I first wrote a book, I did not, I really didn't understand just kind of how long they take. <laughs> Um, this book itself is a decade in a making, or a decade in the making. Um, it began, at least for me, from an archival find in 2008, uh, an annual progress report of the Uganda Cancer Institute that I found tucked away in archives in Philadelphia. Um, and at the time, I was really interested in kind of histories of biomedical and scientific research on the continent. Um, I was really interested in histories of HIV and AIDS. Um, and I found this report and saw, thought to myself, cancer research in Idi Amin's Uganda, how fascinating might that be? 
Um, and, you know, that was 2008. And now we are here with the book in 2021. Um, so briefly, Africanizing Oncology is a historical ethnography of the Uganda Cancer Institute, uh, photographed here in 1967. This is the lymphoma treatment center as it was. Um, and in the 1960s, the UCI was a small chemotherapy clinical trials facility. And this is the lymphoma treatment center as it was in 2012. Um, if you had a chance to read the epilogue of the book, you'll know that this is actually the facility that I described that was bulldozed uh, and turned into this. Um, over the past 50 years, the Uganda Cancer Institute has grown remarkably. And today it serves a population catchment of over 40 million and is a center of oncology excellence. And the book is both a history of the UCI and a history of Uganda since independence. And when I started writing, when I started working on this book um, in the early 2010s for the dissertation research, I was very interested in conversations about new scrambles for African research subjects in the global health industry. Um, and what was really unique and what was really different about the UCI was that it was a 50 year old institution which had long used collaborative medical research as a resource for expanding cancer for services for a broader Ugandan public. Um, and many international partners such as the Fred Hutch here have come to Uganda since the 1950s to study and treat cancers. Um, but international collaborators come and international collaborators go. It was and is ultimately Ugandans who keep experiments going and freezers operating. They provide care to the patients on the wards of the UCI long after expatriate colleagues leave or research results are published and funding cycles end. And it's really been a collective commitment to keeping things going uh, that, re that explains the remarkable durability of this institution over the past 50 years. So rather than a case of unilateral extraction, cancer research in Uganda was and continues to be generative for creating long lasting cancer care infrastructures for Ugandan publics. Um, and there's a lot that we could say about the ways in which this building, um, you know, which was designed to do international research collaborations, but now also provides kind of an outpatient chemotherapy service. There's a whole story about the tensions of that in, embedded in this building. Um, and let me move this forward. So, I wanted to talk just briefly about the title and about also this Independence Day stamp. Um, when I'm talking about Africanizing oncology, I'm really talking about Africanizing oncology as it, as it pertains to the historic Ugandan case. Um, if, you have, if you do have an opportunity to read the book and especially if you read chapter three, um, which is all about Idi Amin, um, the book really asks, a, the book really traces the attempts over multiple generations um, to basically Ugandanize biomedical expertise in the country. Um, this stamp is taken from, is part of a larger series commemorating Ugandan independence in, the in 1962 on October 9th. We're coming up to the 60 year anniversary really soon. And in the back is Mulago Hospital, um, which you may have had a chance to read about in the book. Um, and, you know, Milago Hospital has long been the teaching hospital in Uganda. Um, it started as a venereal disease treatment center in, the in 1914. Um, you know, today over 100 babies are born at Mulago a day. It's a gigantic teaching infrastructure. Um, and you can also see here this uh, x-ray technician in this fabulous lead apron. Um, you know, performing an x-ray with this newly donated machine or with this newly provisioned machine, um, which probably came, you know, through the port of Mombasa, uh, you know, up the, up the Kenyan Ugandan railway and was then delivered here. Um, and so a big part, you know, we, 
I do read this stamp as a celebration of triumphant biomedical modernity in 1962. And the book asks, so what happens after these gifts arrive and technologies are put into place and people are trained? Um, what are the ways, how and in what ways um, does the, does do political, economic, um, scientific circumstances, how do they wind up shaping this technology when it arrives? Um, and I took, in shaping the theoretical architecture for this book, I, I took a lot of inspiration from Clapperton Mavunga's work, um, which I don't know if you've had a chance to read um, his book, Transient Workspaces. Weird title, but brilliant book. Um, and he has some really great theoretical work done um, on incoming technologies, particularly as they rate, uh, particularly as they relate to firearms. I really recommend it. So, so to give you a sense of the contents, um, so the book makes three interrelated arguments. And the first argument is that cancer research and experiments have shaped the built and social infrastructure for cancer care in Uganda over the past 50 years. I use the term experimental infrastructure to describe the constellation of physical facilities, research questions, care practices, data collection procedures, and human labor that make research and care function on a day-to-day -day basis at the UCI. The second argument is that many of oncology's treatment technologies originally came to Uganda through international research partnerships or as gifts but they were fundamentally transformed once they arrived there. And efforts to maintain, repair, and tinker with these imported oncological technologies can teach us much about what it means to keep experimental infrastructures going. Um, and lastly, the Uganda Cancer Institute offers a unique vantage point for considering the relationships between politics and science. And throughout the book, I really treat the hospital as a microcosm of political, scientific, economic, and social life in Uganda since independence. Um, so for example, chapter four, rocket launchers and toxic drugs um, talks about the war of liberation slash Tanzanian invasion in 1979 and the ways in which um, rocket launchers that were literally falling from the sky wound up becoming key metaphors for describing the experiences of chemotherapy treatments in, in, in Uganda in the 1980s and 1990s. Um, when radiotherapy travels, uh, what I, I would say is the chapter in the book that really encapsulates this argument about oncology's uh, treatment technologies traveling. Um, and if you're interested, uh, the summary of that chapter is actually out in technology and culture. And I would be happy to send you a copy of that article if you're interested. So, and I would just say that the method is that I've, you know, we talked about following stuff last week or a couple weeks ago, um, you know, but the method has really been to pay keen attention to the stories of physicians, nurses, laboratory technicians, administrators, patients, families, and even occasional politicians who have lived and died on the wards of the UCI over four generations from the 1950s onwards. Um, and what I'm really trying to do in the book is to situate Africans at the center of biomedical research stories as knowledge producers, rather than simply bodies for experimentation and extraction by white Western scientists. Um, and I think that this photograph really encapsulates what I'm attempting to do in the book. Um, so this is a photograph of the Lymphoma Treatment Center opening in 1967. Um, this is Dr. Dennis Burkett, um, who, is, who was an Irish surgeon. Um, chapter one, the African lymphoma, talks about the discovery of this particular pediatric lymphoma. Um, that was highly responsive to chemotherapy treatments um, and became kind of the raison d'etre of this site. 
Um, and Burkitt was a colonial medical officer um, who did a lot of research on this on this cancer, um, but then also knew that he was on his way out. His his um, contract expired. Sebastian Chowazi, uh, the gentleman who's examining this patient here, um, was the director of the Department of Surgery at Mankara Medical School for many many years. Um, was highly interested in cancer research. Um, and was really kind of at the front of um, the front of projects to Africanize biomedical expertise in Uganda. Um, and you can learn more about him in the book. Um, so that's kind of an overall, you know, kind of overview of the book. I would say that, you know, when I was when I was working on this book, and, and this is where I want to take us a bit to talk about decolonization, all of these conversations that we're having about decolonizing global health right now. Um, you know, my questions and preoccupations animating this book were not about decolonizing global health at all. Um, they were about how to write with sensitivity, honesty, and integrity about the history of biomedical research and care in Eastern Africa. Um, and I just want to kind of fill in a bit of that historiography for you. Um, Amina, is it okay if I talk for about 10 more minutes? Yes, sounds good. And then, absolutely. Ava? Uh, yes. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> All right. I, I can also cut now if you just want to get to Q&A. I think we'd love to hear you speak further about this, and then we could have half an hour of a discussion. Okay, sounds great. Um, all right. So, uh, so I just want to then again give you a little more context that you wouldn't be able to read in the book. Um, you know, so when I start, and um, I just, again, I, I'm a visual thinker and like thinking with historical objects. Um, so this is a photograph uh, from the celebrations of the Uganda Cancer Institute's 50th anniversary. Uh, a colleague, a photographer, a colleague of mine, um, and I, Andrea Stoltens, um, we ended up putting together a photography exhibition of the UCI in the past and present. Um, this is Dr. Jackson Orem, uh, who's the current director of the Uganda Cancer Institute, and standing next to him um, is Professor Charles Oleni, uh, who was the director of the UCI in the 1970s um, and continues to sit on the UCI's board. And again, if you had a chance to read the epilogue, um, these are some names to faces for you. Um, so. A little more context uh, that you can't get just by reading the introduction. Um, when I first started working on the history of the Institute over 10 years ago, um, some colleagues asked me if I was really doing African history. So I'm just trying to give you a sense of the landscape of what it's been like to work on this project, you know, in, on like the Eastern seaboard and in California. Um, indeed, I get, at one point, I gave a talk about the UCI at a prestigious American university on the East Coast that will remain unnamed. Um, and when I got to the q and I was asked if biomedicine was actually a legitimate thing to be studying in the historiography of health and healing in Africa. I know that my jaw dropped. <laughs> Um, you know, my colleague was well versed in the historiography, um, therapeutic pluralism, the political economy of disease, the management of epidemics as a form of colonial power and control were all were all familiar subjects. Um, but African physician intellectuals were not something that this colleague was prepared for. Um, you know, I was writing about a post independence era biomedical institution. I was writing about doctors, nurses, lab techs, politicians, patients, and caretakers. Um, I was writing about a pediatric cancer I was writing about pediatric cancer research that wound up being hugely beneficial to a local study pop pop population as well as international researchers. And I was writing about a place that not only survived but actually thrived under Idi Amin. 
and I was combining historical and ethnographic methods. Um, so I think that this admixture of time period, historical actors, a story of medical beneficence rather than simple exploitation, a methodological pluralism and a micro historical focus on an, on an institution. All of this struck some colleagues as unusual. Um, and I imagine that if I went back to that prestigious university now and told them about this book, they would say that writing a contemporary history of an African cancer research hospital is a completely leg legitimate pursuit. I haven't changed at all. I mean, I have changed in the, the sense that my hair has gotten a little more gray, um, but something has also changed in the last 10 years um, in conversations, in historiographic conversations that colleagues are having in the US and Europe. Um, and I'm just going to delineate that a little bit more. Um, you know, first of all, conversations that we were having um, in various spaces from Steve Fireman's Fet Shrift on social health in 2010 to multiple conferences arranged by Wenzel Geisler, Noemi Toussignon, Ruth Prince, and others on issues of capacity and biomedical practice. Um, a lot of that's finally been published. And there have also been some outstanding new critiques and ethnographies of biomedicine and global health in Africa, written by colleagues such as Uruka Okeke, Nawazi Mikwanazi, Chisomo Kalinga, Claire Wendland, Rayma McKay, Cal Burek, Betsy Breda, Benson Mulemi, Julie Livingston, and others. Um, there are also several rich new histories of biomedical research ethics by colleagues such as Abena Oseo Asare, Melissa Grayboys, Jennifer Tappan, Mary, we Mary Weeble, and others. Um, I would say that Randall Packard's history of global health has offered a, a terrific overview of the imperial and colonial roots of interventions into the lives of other people. Um, Simukai Chigudu's brilliant book on cholera in Zimbabwe reanimates political economy with a keen freshness. Um, I'm not recounting anything particularly new here, and I would say that Nancy Hunt's suturing new medical histories offers a really excellent overview of this historiography and the shifting terrain. And there's obviously much more in the introduction of the book than what I can go into here. Um, and it's just been interesting. I would say, you know, that this proliferation um, of, of new work is what we could call a biomedical turn. And the biomedical turn marks a time when colleagues are increasingly interested in interrogating the materiality, the practices, the spaces, and the practitioners themselves of biomedicine and African health spaces. Um, I don't think it's possible to separate this from, a, from the broader historical context of, H of the HIV epidemic in Africa. And indeed, I would argue that the HIV epidemic um, compelled me and many other Americans in particular who are working in this field um, to get serious about histories of health on the continent. Um, and many American contemporaries who I mentioned are roughly my age. Um, you know, so I'm talking about neoliberal Reagan babies um, who may have studied at the University of Cape Town in the early 2000s, such as myself, um, at the height of the HIV treatment access crisis in South Africa. Um, and I know that I got into the history and anthropology of biomedicine um, in Africa because of prior experiences in global health um, that felt profoundly and ethically fraught. Um, and I can only speak to myself because I was also, but I was also drawn to working on histories of biomedicine in Uganda um, because of how high and literal the life and death, the life and death stakes really were, um, and they continue to be. So uh, in order to really get at these life and death stakes, many of us turn to reckoning with the hospital, the clinic, the lab, the physical spaces of biomedical care. And ethnographers and historians alike, and I'm, I'm talking about outsider ethnographers and historians, right? So 
you know, there is a long history of this. This is a photograph of Dr. John Ziegler, founding director of the Uganda Cancer Institute um, at the UCI in the 1960s uh, with patients. Um, so ethnographers and historians alike, I would, I would suggest, came face to face with the material realities of biomedical tertiary care in the wake of structural adjustment in the HIV epidemic. Um, and these are spaces that Kristen Peterson would call a hollowed state, what Paul Farmer would call a clinical desert. Um, but what my colleague, Dr. Z at, radio, at Mulago's radiotherapy unit would simply call where we are working at. And I would argue that it's just extremely challenging to historicize biomedicine and decouple it from the present moment of techno philanthropy and global health the austerity of structural adjustment, the experimentality of antiretroviral therapy. Um, but it's even more difficult to separate the everyday stakes that we witness as ethnographers and work to historicize. Um, and this is the reason I wanted you to read the introduction of the book where I wrestle with the question of audience and how to strike a balance between creativity and crisis, repair and destruction, hope and despair. And I wanted you to read the epilogue to take you into the often heartbreaking yet totally quotidian stakes of what it's like to work in one of these settings. Um, and there are all of these questions. Am I doing justice to, to this situation? Am I simply recapitulating the suffering of strangers? Am I being overly celebratory of the work that medical colleagues such as Dr. Fred Okuku pictured here are doing in these settings? Have I managed to give you a sense of where we are working at? Have I been able to move beyond a fetishization of scarcity? Have I been able to add complexity and nuance to what is not working while not pathologizing it? Have I done right by the charismatic heroes who are acting creatively in times of crisis to make ends meet? Have I adequately metabolized Nolwazi McQuinazi's excellent critique of this, of this genre that she goes into in her discussion of single stories in writing about African medical contexts. Um, as we all know, the introduction of a book is the last thing that we write, but it's the first thing that you read um, when a book is finally opened up. And the framing that I had for this project 10 years ago remains largely the same. Um, if you went back to, uh, you know, Grant, grant applications that I submitted to the SSRC and to the Wenner Gren, um, you'll see that experimental infrastructures and situating African physicians at the center rather than the periphery of knowledge production is, is the core project. Yeah, but in, in a lot of ways, I feel that the theoretical architecture of the book is being unraveled by new conversations about global health equity, decolonizing global health, the death of Paul Farmer, um, the uneven fallout of COVID-19, especially as it relates to global vaccination inequities. Um, on the other hand, I can't think of a more powerful story of the everyday stakes of decolonizing biomedicine and global health than the story of the UCI. Um, so it's taken over 10 years for this field at least as it is in the US, um, to embrace the fact that biomedicine is something we can legitimately write about and historicize. I imagine it's going to take us at least another 10 to, 10 to come to a reckoning of what we're talking about when we're talking about decolonizing global health. And no doubt many of these conversations will be about the politics of representation and identity as they should. <laughs> Um, including a much needed critique of the subject position of the Mzungu scholar of African biomedicine. Um, and obviously an out, being an outsider whose Luganda was patchy um, shaped my understanding of things differently than say a Ugandan patient caretaker or an expatriate oncologist. Um, but I think a far more interesting question to ask is why not one of the many Ugandan colleagues who made this book possible over the years had the time or the funding or the resources or indeed the specific training that I had in order to do this work. 
Um, and one of the things that I really have tried to do as, as a writer in the book is open up spaces where I hope that Ugandan journalists or Ugandan oncologists will really tear at the seams of it and say what, what I got wrong. Um, I'm really hoping that there will be some sort of dialogue about that. Um, and I also hope that the book opens up enough of a space to think about the social basis and political economy of research, not only at the UCI, but the scholarly production of knowledge itself. Um, but I hope that you're moved. I hope that you're inspired by the many stories of life and living at the UCI. We have much to learn from how Ugandan physician intellectuals, field workers savvy in forging friendships, resilient patients, and invested caretakers keep things going, be they buildings, bodies, experiments, kitchens, therapeutics, blood banks, or optimism. So I thank you, and I'm going to stop talking so we can have a much more interesting conversation. Um, the paperback is coming. The paperback is coming in September 2022. Um, and all the book royalties, which will not be very sizable, but they may happen eventually, um, will be going to a fund for pediatric care at the UCI. Okay, so I'm gonna stop my share. Thank you so much, uh, Marissa, for this wonderful uh, presentation on the book. I specifically loved um, how you phrased very straightforwardly in the book as well that you're not taking a stance from which you're speaking about the institutes from a place of scarcity uh, or disadvantage, but how scarcity is malleable and how it's transformed by um, the people who, the physicians and the oncologists who are in that space. Um, I have some questions, but I would love to open up the floor to the participants that are with us. So if you have a question, you can raise your hand through the Zoom tool, or you can drop your question in the chat. Um, but ideally, we'd love to see you and hear you and, and have you engage with um, Marissa. In the meantime, I can ask my questions uh, as we wait for uh, other questions. So I was really intrigued by um, the terminology of uh, cancerology and oncology. And I was wondering about how does sort of Western biomedicine and its understanding of cancerology and oncology shape this landscape of Africanization uh, within the Ugandan context um, that you write about? And how do you also understand these two terms? Do, do you see them as... Um, synonymous to one another, or do they refer to two different epistemic landscapes? Uh, so cancerology and oncology? Yes. Um, ah. Yeah, so um, the way that I've wound up thinking about oncology in the book is really kind of largely from um, medical oncology and chemotherapists in particular. Um, so think, so again, as a historian, I'm always thinking about things as, as they happen in history. Um, so oncology and, and also because colleagues themselves identify themselves as on oncologists <laughs> rather than cancer specialists, usually, um, they often identify themselves as either so with most of the chemotherapists I work with, um, they work, you know, they would identify themselves as medical oncologists or chemotherapy specialists. Um, colleagues in the radiotherapy department would identify themselves as radiotherapy oncologists or, or more often than not radiotherapists. Um, and then most surgeons would just, most surgeons, even if they're doing surgical oncology, would just describe themselves as surgeons because that's often what surgeons do. Um, so cancerology, I don't know that I use it that much in the book. I do describe cancer research quite a bit. And I would say that as far as cancer research goes, I'm really just describing, I'm just using it as a way to um, kind of either describe clinical trials um, or cancer or kind of going out into the field um, or doing or doing micro 
microbiological studies. Am I getting at your question? I am not quite there. Um, sorry, I think, yeah, I think there were two parts. I think you answered one part and the other one was perhaps, um, perhaps the impact of Western biomedicine on the understanding of oncology within the Ugandan context. Sure. So again, I really am treating this as a as a historian. Um, so, and am writing about kind of the history of cancer research, and in particularly chemotherapy treat and the history of chemotherapy research. Um, so, if you look at the book, and Sorry, I'm having such a I'm having such a Monday morning right now. And it's so funny. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so what I will say is that the answer to your question about kind of the long history of Western medical research and the ways that it relates to cancer research in Uganda um, is that it Sorry. I'm literally having a Monday, such a Monday. Um, can you get back to me because I'm just, because I'm, I'm having a really hard time figuring out how to answer your question without just recapitulating 200 pages of the book to you. Um, because the whole book is basically about how in the 1950s, uh, or really beginning in the 1940s, um, there were a group of colonial medical pathologists working at Mulago Hospital um, who were really interested in delineating the differences between patterns of cancer in spaces like the United Kingdom and patterns of cancer in a place like Uganda. Um, and so cancer research in Uganda kind of took on two main flavors. The first main flavor was surveillance and registration. Um, so, Uganda actually, so Uganda actually has one of the oldest cancer registries on the African continent, um, which really began in the 1940s as a way to do this sort of descriptive surveillance work. So you have that thread. To what extent is that Western medicine? It could just be a sense of, it could just be more like Western surveillance. And then there's another thread that's braided through this whole 50 year history, um, which is a history of medical oncology research. Um, so starting in the 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, in the United States and in the United Kingdom, um, there's all of this pioneering yet failing work on pediatric leukemia, right? So beginning, so things like the VAMP trials at the National Cancer Institute, um, which were combining different chemotherapy drugs to see if you could actually create long lasting remissions um, for cancer patients, for pediatric cancer patients. Um, and just failing over and over and over again, right? Like the early history of leukemia research is a history of failure. Meanwhile, in Uganda at this time, um, a particular pediatric cancer is discovered, Burkitt's lymphoma, which turns out to be highly, highly, highly responsive to cytotoxic agents that are available at the time. So, there's then this question where you have all of these National Cancer Institute physicians coming and traveling to Uganda to try to understand why remissions for Burkitt's lymphoma are so much better than remissions for pediatric lung cancer in the, in, in the United States. And it all kind of goes from there. Um, so you have a set of research questions that are overlapping. <laughs> And you have a context that winds up being really, really useful um, for studying that. For studying that, does that help to answer your question a little bit? 
very much and i think the on my end i think yeah i feel very lucky that i have the book because i get to think more with this question as i read the other chapters but thank you very much yeah, no, it's a great question. I'm sorry. Just like I said, it's like, because it's so the elephant, <laughs> it took me a second to figure out like if I should describe the trunk to you or if I should describe the tail or if I should describe the stump of the leg. Um, but I hope the book will answer your question. I think it will, most definitely. Um... To our dear participants, um, again, feel free to drop your questions on the chat or to raise your hand um, in the using the Zoom reaction tool. Um, there was a question, Marissa, that was asked to you uh, when we met uh, in person, which um, which was asked by Dom, who's here, and it was really interesting to think about it. And I know you may have um, you may have touched uh, about some of it during your presentation, which was so there is Africanizing oncology. What was before the Africanization period, and how was the landscape? Um, and how did you sort of historically theorize that? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. Um, so you're, so basically we're talking about kind of what did oncology or what did cancer look like before, before, the Africans, this, before the Africanization of oncology in the 1950s, 1960s. Um, I didn't delve into that question too much. Um, you'll see some small gestures in the book um, to the history of Albert Cook's medical records um, taken at Mango Hospital in the early 1900s. Um, so Albert Cook uh, was a colonial medical physician, or no, actually a missionary medical physician, um, who set up Mango Hospital kind of on the outskirts of Kampala at, as, as a missionary enterprise. Um, and he took very detailed case records, um, and you can actually see if you go through the case records even now, um, and a, a historical record of different tumors. Um, I would say that cancer up until it kind of coalesced as cancer in this particular, in, in the 1950s, 1960s, um, was seen as you know a form of witchcraft or of sense sickness, um, and I think that you know I, I tried to gesture to some of the limitations of what it's been to be an outside expatriate American working on this with Patchy Luganda, um, and I would say that you know I didn't have the skill set really to get at that question, um, <laughs> so I'm hoping that at some point in time somebody actually will. Um, and I think that it's not so much that, and I would also say that, you know, cancer, before it becomes cancer, and Julie Livingston writes about this quite beautifully in Improvising Medicine about how cancer really becomes cancer um, on the wards, on the ward at Princess Marina, um, you know, that there are still plenty of ways in which a bodily state of living with a tumor or a bodily state of living with Burkitt's lymphoma before you arrive at the Uganda Cancer Institute and before you get a diagnosis, um, you know, is, is misfortune, is sense sickness, is a relative trying to kill you, you know, all of these, or, you know, or is an ulcer or is a toothache or any of these things. Um, and again, I think that there's a lot of room that I've left in the book to ask those kinds of questions um, and do that kind of research project. Thank you so much, Marissa. That was pretty helpful to think with. Um, I think Mimi has a question. Mimi, please go ahead. You can unmute. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marissa, for uh, presenting your book. Um, which I, I appreciate. I appreciate um, the approach at 
Hello, am I there? Oh, there we are. Sorry, my connection has been intermittent. I appreciate the approach um, of you're using to understand illness. And I'm wondering um, if you could just speak to me about um, the materiality with respect to oncology from um, the, uh, uh, this book that you've written, um, taking into account um, the malleable scarcity that you've 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 pointed mm -hmm. out. How can you unpack what the materiality of oncology is like um, in this landscape? Well, at least I'm I'm especially interested in in, in technology. I'm being selfish a little bit. I'm thinking of technology mm -hmm. and how it might look like with respect to the material aspect of of cancer. Yeah. So in the book, I. I you know, take two traveling technologies quite seriously. Um, I take chemotherapy very seriously, and I also take radiotherapy very seriously. Um, and you know, those are kind of like in the holy trinity of like poison, cut, burn. You know, in in terms of oncology care, you, there's a lot of poison, and there's also a lot of burning often. Um, so if you and you can read, and, and what I try to do is I really try to track these changes and these transformations over time. Um, because we're visual here, I'd like to just try to take you to, um, I think the easiest way to answer your question, Mimi, is to actually bring you in. Um, Are you able to share your screen? Yeah, I'm there. I'm sorry. Um, no. Let me just. Uh... So here we are. We're here. So, um, so talking about malleable scarcity. Um, so in chapter five, I write about the history of the radiotherapy machine. Um, and the radiotherapy machine at Mulago um, began as a gift in 1960 or in 1991. Um, there was one Cobalt 60 machine that was procured through an IAEA partnership. Um, so the International Atomic Energy Association or the International Atomic Energy Agency in the early 1990s um, You'll, you'll see that in the book, there are these periodic moments where cancer suddenly becomes visible to the international community. And it's like, oh, cancer is an issue on the continent. And, um, and then you'll see these infusions of cash and resources and training. So just like these tiny micro pushes of infrastructural, of, of building out infrastructure. Um, and then basically saying to, uh, in this case, the Ugandan government, okay, we've given you a demonstration project and we've given you an infusion of cash. Now it's your goal to, now it is your responsibility to maintain it. Um, so again, chapter five traces the history of the GWGP80 machine, um, which is a cobalt 60 machine pictured here manufactured uh, in China, um, a pretty simple machine as far as these machines go. Um, one that the IAEA would describe as rugged, durable, simple, affordable. Um, but the machine that Mulago received was also secondhand, had been recently refurbished and was honestly about to be decommissioned anyway, but then, you know, winds up having this second life um, at Mulago. And by the time I was working, um, and 20 years later, you know, the Institute had, or the machine itself had a lot of frequent breakdowns. 
Um, there was one mechanic who was Mr. T, who was responsible for basically running, um, who was responsible for running uh, the maintenance of this machine. Um, this is a photograph of it here. Um, at one time, actually, the force back um, system that was used to kind of move the cobalt in and out of place uh, wound up breaking, the vacuum seal wound up breaking for it. Um, and so there's actually a repurposed oil seal from a Kampala junkyard uh, that now sits within the machine that, or that was sitting in the machine to make the vacuum actually work. Um, so, and again, rugged, simple, affordable. Um, the other kind of interesting thing about the radiotherapy machine was that um, cobalt, the cobalt 60 uh, that was that was inside the machine at this time had actually gone through its decay period. Um, so the cobalt 60 itself uh, had needed to be replaced in 2005, um, but was still being used in 2012. Um, so, and again, so Mimi, to answer your question, you know, this is kind of one way that I'm thinking about the malleability of scarcity. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I do write, I'm interested in, you know, kind of these ideas of, you know, technology traveling, um, how do things break, how do people keep things going, um, how does a technocratic imagination and a bunch of colleagues sitting in Vienna, you know, putting together a very small pile of cash, um, and then, you know, relatively speaking, and then basically dumping something there and saying, well, and dumping machinery and then saying it's now up to you to maintain it. What does that actually mean and how does that actually work? So, um, so again, I could go, and just one more thing, because again, I could talk about this for the next five hours. Um, I would say that some of the theoretical work that's wound up being really useful for me in terms of thinking about the malleability of scarcity and how scarcity works over time um, is Stephen Jackson's work on repair. Um, so there's a great uh, article on repair worlds um, from 2013. I'd be happy to send it to you. Um, where, you know, where Jackson's doing a lot of very interesting work um, to contextualize and think about repair. Um, and some colleagues feel that he's overly romanticizing repair worlds, um, but I've found it to be a very useful thing to think with. Um, so I'll stop there because I think we have another, we, I think we have some more questions. Um, we, Mimi, did I get at the heart of your question, though, before we go on? Yes, thank you so much for sharing that and um, giving that uh, uh, um, description. And I, I have taken down um, some of your, your, your notes, especially um, Jackson's uh, work on repair. So thank you for, for elaborating on, on that point. And Marissa and everyone with us, I just want to say that we're approaching the 4 p.m., 5 p.m. CST dot. Um, but we'd love to extend for another 10 minutes to yeah. with the questions that we got from Divine. Um, Marissa, or perhaps should we ask Divine to, to unmute and, and ask his questions? Um, but they're also visible on the chat. Divine, if you're if you can hear us. He's unable to. Um, so the question is why creativity and what is creative about a crisis or the crisis of cancer? And the second question is why is the idea of Africa and African in a project that is the project of the hospital that is part of the civilization and colonization mission from Europe? Why is Africa important for this book? What does it do analytically? What does it make legible or intelligible. Thank you, Divine. 
Indeed, this, this is like the five hour conversation, right, Divine? <laughs> right. So, um, so, and I think that, you know, you're, you're anticipating where I'm, where I'm going, where I'm kind of at the point to where I'm, I'm ready to stop calling myself an Afri an Africanist um, <laughs> after, after 20 years of this, but then also I think thinking about what is useful here. So, um, so why creativity? Um, I would say that uh, when I arrived in Kampala in 2009, 2000, uh, 2010, um, it was the first word that really came to mind in terms of articulating the ways in which I was watching people make things work on a daily basis. Um, so as an ethnographer for the first, like for the first summer that I was in Kampala in 2009, um, I spent, this is going to sound like such a Mzungu ethnographer thing and I apologize for it, but it was actually really instructive. I, I spent a massive amount of time on public transportation because I was living in the wrong place of, in the wrong part of town. And so it would literally take me about two hours every morning to get to language class at McCarray University because I had to go around, snake around the colonial roundabout that, um, you know, had been put in by that had been put in by Kampala city planners in the 1960s that maybe made sense when you had 30,000 vehicles instead of, you know, like 3 million people populating the city. Um, and so you would just spend all of this time in traffic and you would see these incredibly creative things that people were doing to maintain vehicles, make commerce happen, make this, you know, make this infrastructure that clearly wasn't working, working. Um, and I found, and I just found it to be highly creative. <laughs> um, and when I worked in the hospital, it was kind of the same thing. I would say that there are a lot of similarities between Mulago Hospital and the old Kampala taxi park um, and the ways in which people are making something work um, when in reality, it doesn't seem like it should be working all that well. Um, the crisis of cancer seems to be everywhere and nowhere. Uh, when I was last in Uganda um, to launch the book in, in March, um, the, the, speaker, the Speaker of Parliament of Uganda was actually being treated for cancer in Seattle, Washington by the Fred Hutchinson. Oh, creativity versus, okay, got it. Um, <laughs> I feel like these are such old conversations in like history of technology, right? <laughs> It's interesting because I think that I, I don't know how much I use the word innovation versus creativity in the book. It would be interesting for me to do a word count um, because I think that there are a lot of innovations that come out of the Institute, um, especially in the 1960s uh, when you have colleagues who are simply connecting the dots that if you actually want to treat cancer patients, you have to create um, you have to treat whole families rather than individual patients. Um, so the, the major innovation at this place in the 1960s, in addition to, to combination chemotherapy, um, was actually the Volkswagen Beetle, you know, which was being used to drive all over Kampala and or drive all over Uganda and make maps and actually go to villages. I would argue that it was highly is where does the innovation begin and where does the, you know like where do these things you know touch? Um, I specifically wanted to avoid innovation. I I don't know why. 
I just felt like creativity was a better word. <laughs> Um, and perhaps that's because I could see creativity popping up in lots of different places. Um, and I wanted to, but I also wanted to push, you know, your, I wanted to push back against improvisation a bit. Um, <clears throat> and I wanted to think about something that transcends the hospital. Um, you know, and wanted to kind of capture what I was seeing as an ethnographer in Uganda across the board. Uh, we can talk about it more for five hours um, with some strong pinotage. <laughs> She'll be brutal. Um, okay. <laughs> and this idea of Africa and African in this project, you know, I mean, 10 years ago or like, 15 years ago, right? The whole reason I wanted to become an Africanist was because I was in public health school and I hated it. Um, I, didn't, I didn't want to become a technocrat. I was at the Johns Hopkins University, you know, basically studying how to, um, like how to do yet another failed condom intervention. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, just by a whole like force of accident, Randall Packard was, you know, teaching at Hopkins in the time across the, across the street at Johns Hopkins History of Medicine Department. And there were these really fabulous historians of Africa who were working there. So like Sarah Berry, Pierre Larson, Randall Packard. Again, there's a whiteness to this um, and there's an area studies quality to this. Um, but that kind of space of thinking of, of thinking about African history, about thinking about um, current conversations in global health as something that we couldn't decouple from broader histories of colonial medicine, that it was just really important and really energizing. Um, and I think that, and you know, I, I really wanted to be a serious area studies person. Um, you know, which is why I went to go and work with like the oldest, right? Like Steve, like it doesn't get more kind of like, I want a lineage than to go and study with Steve Fireman at, you know, at, at Penn and be like, oh, like, you know, I'm even post Wisconsin. Oh, Pierre, he, I, yeah, he, Dom, thank you for saying this. Um, just, I mean, Pierre, Pierre made so many, like Pierre made a very, very large impact on this project. Um, and it's heartbreaking that he passed so soon. Um, so, but I would say that being an Africanist, at least being at a place like the University of Pennsylvania uh, in, a, in a department like the History and Sociology of Science, um, often meant that you were an outsider, right? So, or at least that I was an outsider. Um, most of my colleagues were writing about, were doing pretty straightforward histories of science, pretty straightforward histories of medicine. Um, you know, colleagues were surprised that there was biomedicine in Africa, <laughs> you know, that you could work, were like really oncology, like you could study a group of African oncologists in, in Uganda, that sounds shocking. Um, you know, so um, sometimes this identity and identity and, and area studies is useful and sometimes it isn't. Um, but again, I think that we could have a much longer conversation about it. I, I mean, I wound up, I think when we were, um, when we were talking in Cape Town a couple of weeks ago, I mean, I talked about, I had talked about, you know, kind of why this book wound up in a very traditional new African history series at a traditional US press, you know, that widely publishes in African studies, um, as opposed to something like sexy, like Duke or Chicago. Um, that was a very strategic choice Anyway, there, there are so many, I recognize that we're at time, there are so many reasons why I want to abolish area studies yet hang on to it desperately, um, <laughs> that, that 
that we can just uh, we can pick it up at a different time. Because um, I think we are at time, are we not? We are indeed. Thank you so much, Devan, for your questions, and thank you, Marissa, for your explanations and for extending further the conversation. It's been really lovely to hear about the book both in. Cape Town and now here, and I hope we can continue the conversation further at some point. Um, thank you to everyone who's joined us and who's listened and tuned in. Uh, please join us for more HUMA events that are happening this month. Next week, we are going to launch um, a book by Edward Fosh Villaronga and Hadassah Drukarch on AI for healthcare robotics. Um, so please join in and Marissa, I don't know, sorry, my cat, like, <laughs> um, Marissa, is there anything else you'd like to, to end us with, um, before we say goodbye? Oh, just thanks for your 7am patience. I'm sorry. It took me a second to kind of get into your Q&A. <laughs> um, no, so thank fun. you for accommodating the time and, um, yeah, it's it's not easy, but thank you so much for being patient. Yeah. And um, if there if there are questions for if anybody wants to follow up on anything, I'm always very happy to send things. Um, and uh, Divine, I have I'm following up with you today on something that's not about this, but it's much more exciting. Okay, okay. fabulous humans, have a uh, wonderful day. Yeah, and. Uh, sending i'm keeping my load shedding app on my phone so i know when it's happening for you all <laughs>